So if everybody would get a little cozier to make space, that would be great. <laughs> 
the Maxwell next door has a new exhibit that just opened on basketry. Um, looks really awesome, and if anybody has time during their lunch break or later today, please pull over and stop by and check that out. Too. All right, we're gonna get kicked off again. Um, we are gonna start back up. We've got a few papers before we'll take another break for lunch later. Um, our first topic, our first presentation now is gonna be by James Sneed. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. Good to, good to be here. I, before I start, I wanna uh, make a, um, dedicate this um, paper to Genevieve Head, who many of us know, who passed away recently, um, a very good friend of mine, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate in that the opportunity to come and give this presentation today also puts me in, uh, in New Mexico um, for her memorial service, which is in Santa Fe this afternoon, so I'm going to leave after the section of papers and go up there for that, so um, just to acknowledge her. All right, unpacking erasure. Catherine Marsh Sumner and the History of Southwestern Archaeology. I'm going to start with this photograph here, uh, which I, I ran across back in the 1990s in one of those grab bag um, archaeological collections at the National Anthropological Archives in Washington, D.C. Um, so miscellaneous photographs, uh, this was, was there. Um, I subsequently published this in some, some work that I did published in the early 2000s, but it's a great sort of a place to start talking about tropes related to the history of women um, in, in American archaeology. So when I found this image, I was looking for uh, Richard Wetherill, who you can see in this photograph, um, and I was aware from the limited um, documentation for the image that uh, uh, the, the other members of the party were the, the Sumner family, and an address was listed in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, the fact that there were, were women in the image was interesting t um, I, in that generic way, but I was thinking about Richard Weddell, so the, that was the end of that story right there, and it's, you know, it's, you know, it's published and it's, it's that. Um, but that was the extent of it. That was the extent, that's how far I followed this um, until um, very recently, and, and thereby maybe hangs more than one tail. So looking at the history of women in Southwestern archaeology particularly um, engages multiple different kinds of tropes, of which I'll, I'll present maybe three of them here just to start with. Um, one of them is obviously misogyny at various levels um, that we can uh, we can unpack um, sort of from active to, to perhaps latent. And I should say that one of the stimuli for me um, working on this project right now came from my mother who asked me once over lunch at the shed in Santa Fe about six or seven years ago, sort of casually, if there were any women in the historical things that I was writing about. And, and my first response, I'd have to say, was, was defensive. Um, I said, well, yes. Uh, but my mother was um, patient, and uh, so I went back to my notes and looked at the women that were in the notes that did not end up in the publications. Um, and then I went back to the archives from which the notes were derived, and there were more women there that I had written notes about. So um, that's, that's a trope, and that's an element of, I would say, of, of misogyny. Another trope for historians of archaeology in general, but that plays in a particular way with people who talk about, about women in this field, um, is what I call the, the lost ancestors or the, the role models trope. Um, we are we're deeply um, attached to our field in most cases, and oftentimes the people that we look for in the past are people who prefigure us. And when I say ancestors here, um, I'm not talking about predecessors. I'm talking about people that um, that were in the past of archaeology who maybe prefigured us in one way or another, um, which is a sort of a, a presentist bias that most of us have. Um, and then there's this question about, about role models, about people in the past um, who, might, uh, who might present models for us in some kinds of ways or who might um, provide hope for us in a very difficult environment. Uh, just a couple of examples that we might pull out here. One is um, the, the, the prominent Native American archaeologist Bertha Parker Cody um, on the right. Um, for those of you familiar with, with the Pajarito Plateau um, 
on the, the famous uh, photograph on the, on the right, which shows up a lot, there you have um, in the far right, Barbara Frere Marico, um, as well as Maud Roy, people who were involved with, um, with Edgar Lee Hewitt in those days and, uh, and, and left kind of an interesting legacy. But, but in the end, I would have to um, suggest that there are only so many people like this um, that we can, that, that exist in the first place, but also that we can, that we can find out more about. Um, and, and, and also dealing with the challenge of, you know, uh, not taking them on their own terms, taking them on the, on, you know, they, they're the people that we want to find, that we might, um, we might uh, see in our, in our own history. Um, and, and this image, um, I find particularly relevant in that case. This is another Pajarino Plateau figure. This is uh, um, Edgar Lee Hewitt on the left lecturing to one of his uh, field schools, or um, summer schools, if you like, um, in the Frioles Canyon in 1912. And I would say we can probably identify Hewitt on the left, uh, Frank Springer and uh, Charles Lummis um, on the right. Uh, the majority of the people in this image are women. Um, and I would gather that almost none of their names are known to us today. Um, even, and even if we knew their names, we could, that could be, that could, the information could be obtained, they would not necessarily ring a bell with us because they weren't archaeologists and they did not go on to be archaeologists, but yet here they are um, in an archaeological context in 1912. And that by itself, I think, is, is telling us something about maybe some, some directions that we should pursue if we're going to really understand um, this history and this, these relationships here. I should also notice that um, if for any of you that, that might have seen my article on uh, Elizabeth Duell in the Eno Palacio in their recent issue, uh, she's um, probably the woman on the far right, um, unfortunately placed between Frank Springer but also um, Charles Lummis with whom her career was unfortunately um, entangled. So. Um, there's an evidentiary bias as well, right? What, where do we go, where do we look for these folks if they're not in our own annals, if they're not in, if they're not in the places where, we, where archaeologists look? Um, there, are, you know, there are some traces of folks, and you know, these, these women in particular um, have some presence in the Edgar Lee papers, for example, so there's, that's, not, that's not a hopeless task. Um, but in a perhaps more specific way, um, we need to broaden our perspectives, we need to dip into different archives, and we need to look at things um, that we wouldn't necessarily uh, think were relevant in a professional sense. So um, in a few minutes, I'm going to show you an image from um, an archive at the Denver Public Library from the, uh, the uh, I guess it's the yearbook of one of the Denver women's service organizations. And I would say very few archaeologists have ever used those kinds of resources, um, and yet where we're going, that they're quite useful and, uh, and informed. So, so lots to unpack here. So this is a, a, a case study, if you like, um, when I'm working on now. And I would say that there actually is a paper attached to this. So if anyone's um, interested in that, I've got to tune it up a little bit. But I would be happy to send on, on to folks, just email me, and I'll pass it on and for, for comment, et cetera. So my topic would be Catherine Marshall, who is um, the woman in the center of this image. Um, the March family um, were newspaper folks in uh, Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And uh, we have on the right side, Laura Marsh, and we have Catherine Marsh, and their sister Helen Marsh, all of whom are pertinent one way or another to the story, although we'll see if I'm going to soak up too much time here, so we'll see how far we can get with them. Um, sort of middle class, upper Midwestern folks. Um, Laura was working for dad at the newspaper and her brother. Um, and, uh, but in 1880, they got the, the bug. Um, by this time, Catherine Marsh was married to George Sumner, who was an attorney. Uh, and the combined Marsh and Sumner families all moved to Durango, where the, uh, the Marshes um, took on the, uh, the Durango Herald. So there was, uh, you know, all the whole sort of combined family all moved west um, and, and lived that kind of sort of frontier life, if you like, um, but on a sort of a middle class level. The, um, the interesting thing with Catherine Marsh Summer is that she became interested in archaeology. And it possible to trace a little bit of this interest going all the way back to, to Wisconsin. Her father, 
um, Jerome Wintermarsh actually excavated the mound on his property um, in rural Wisconsin at one point. Um, and so there's, there's sort of a family tradition there, if you like. Uh, nonetheless, when she arrived in Durango in basically 1880, 1881, um, the, the indigenous heritage of southwestern Colorado is reflected in archaeological um, things, um, attracted her. And so much so that she became quite involved with this. And I owe Fred Blackburn a, a shout out for this, in that um, he had traced, a, it's published in his book on Richard Wetherill, um, traced a, a, an a autobiography by um, a man whose name was Byrne, who was one of the, um, the surgeons at Fort Lewis. And Byrne wrote in his autobiography about how his wife, Laura Lawrenson Byrne, and Catherine Marsh Sumner were spending time um, excavating sites in the, in the Durango area. Now, we actually know very little about that, um, but my hunch is that there are uh, newspaper sources that the Herald is not digitized, for instance. So there are probably newspaper sources in Southwestern Colorado that would be, could be mined for more about these particular kind of activities. But it is worthy of note that we have very few um, firsthand accounts of women excavating um, in Southwestern archaeology at all as early as, as the 1880s. Well, this leads us back to, to this photograph here. Um, which is one of those that were in that box at the National Anthropological Archives um, connected to the Mesa Verde um, and to the Sumner family. So here is a visual record of one of those very, very early um, trips to, to Mesa Verde, um, less than you know, a year after the Weddell family had identified Cliff Palace, et cetera. Um, and here the Sumners are. Um, and there's a, we're going to get to this erasure thing as we go here in a second. Um, but that's, uh, you know, those are the names, those are those folks. And, and contrary to my original impression, um, I've got, they weren't from Washington at all. They were from Durango. And that sort of casts a whole different image on this photograph, 1889 being, being very, very early there. Um, <coughs> um, I should note that uh, Catherine Marsh Sumner shows up in a lot of these pictures, but not very clearly. Um, particularly interesting here, um, to the left is her daughter, whose name was Helen Marsh Sumner. And she actually, Helen went to Wellesley, ultimately, and became a fairly renowned um, economist in the 1910s and 1920s. So there's sort of a, of a, of a lineage of women here that's worth unpacking a little bit in a longer version. So where this led me of ultimately was um, an accession file at the Peabody Museum in, the, in at Harvard and some further documentation indicating that Catherine Marsh Sumner herself was conducting excavations at Mesa Verde during this um, 1889 trip and, and then sort of preceded by these other less documented episodes there. And in fact, there are collections in the Peabody that connect to her excavations here at at some at Mesa Verde. Now um, we could you know we could stop here. There's a little more in the documented record. There's also a um, suggestion that that um, she or a member of her family, and that's not entirely clear, excavated at Pueblo de Arroyo in 1892 or 1893. Um, that's that's a little bit more ephemeral, but there are there's an artifact from Pueblo de Arroyo in that collection, um, and the suggestion is that that, that they, someone was there during that, that period. So that by itself is interesting. And we can stop right there. We can stop and say, okay, um, you know, here's, a, here's a, a woman doing something that we can necessarily anticipate at a fairly early time. Um, but maybe that's playing into that lost ancestors trope about, you know, about a, a precedent for what we do. Uh, and uh, what I am trying to do now is push that further a little bit in maybe a, a, a slightly different direction. In the 1890s, the Sumner family um, moved to Denver, um, at which point they were sort of away from the so sort of specific archaeological interests. And you can sort of wrap it up there if you like, except, and here we've got on the left, Catherine Marsh Sumner, um, and on the right, her sister, Helen Marsh, Marsh Wixton, who ultimately was elected um, um, superintendent of public instruction in Colorado in 1912, I think, was the only um, Republican elected in an otherwise 
total sweep of the Democrats in that era, um, a dynamic, interesting person of her in her own right. Um, I should also say that their third sister, Laura um, Marsh, in Santa Fe, where her parents and her brother moved after they left Durango, um, was, was very influential in the cultural life and the literary life of Santa Fe um, up until um, she died um, young in 1898. So there's a whole, uh, this, this network of women and families and things is really quite, um, quite interesting here. So, but where I wanna go with this in the few minutes that I've got left is, um, is here. So this is the documentary record, the minutes, I guess, of the Monday Literary Club in Denver in 1894. And um, I'll let you read that because I can't see it very clear from what I'm saying here. But two things of interest there. 1894, um, on the one hand, we have Helen Marsh Sumner presenting, a, making a presentation to the, and this would be the sort of middle class of middle class women of Denver in this particular group, making a presentation to them about her archeological work in southwestern Colorado, which by itself is interesting, but at the same time, the leader of this particular um, group, the literary club, is also presenting um, the early evidence for women's advocacy for preservation of Mesa Verde itself and other archaeological um, ruins in, in Colorado. So I mean, that's that. I mean, this is a this is a clearly a sort of broadening of the the interest here. It's it, we've gone from you know doing things on your own to advocating for this for the preservation thing, and I think we all. Um, are pretty aware that this becomes the, the women of Colorado play a major role in this. Um, and so you've got Helen McClurg and the, uh, sorry, Virginia McClurg and the Colorado Cliffords Association. Um, and, and what you can see in these records from these women's organizations is just how broadly based the appeal of preservation is. Uh, that's, there's a lot of room to maneuver there, a lot more to, to learn about that. But also to, to finish up with my theme of erasure, this is the point where you start to see Catherine Marsh Sumner disappearing from um, the historical record. Because to begin with, um, there was an extraordinary, um, as with, I think with, in all of these types of cases, um, a big battle for credit that played out in this organization and in related organizations as to who actually got the job done. Um, with Mesa Verde being preserved, the Antiquities Act being passed, et cetera. And as you watch over the years, you can see um, pe prominent people early sort of phasing out of the newspaper articles and other ones picking up. So it, uh, by the time that, you know, that, that say we're working at Balcony House, um, um, Catherine Marsh Sumner is sort of out of the picture. It was out of the, the written documentation of the women's role here, even though um, that process continued with the, the, uh, um, the preservation of this site and some other ones. So, so she's already sort of being sort of edged out in terms of that organization. Um, but where this really gets interesting to me is what happens to, to her longer term legacy. And uh, I guess blame for ongoing erasure, we could connect to her son, um, Charles Marsh Sumner, um, who was in part a collaborator in some of that early work. The trick was that he was a teenager when most of that stuff happened. He graduated um, from Denver High School in 1893, five years after that trip to Mesa Verde in 1888, when he would have been um, pretty young. So, but he was involved and interested. And over time, um, perceptions that he was the one who was uh, who had done this work um, sort of eclipsed that of his mother, if you like, um, and coming. Well, there's a couple of ways to, to push this. When you go back to, uh, to that Peabody Museum um, accession file, um, there are little traces of not only of, of, of Catherine Marshall, but also her sister, Laura. This is a, an artifact that was taken from, um, from the Surreal's Turquoise Mines that's in that collection. That's the label that was attached to it. And in the documents connected to the collection itself, um, the uh, Charles Sumner notes that this is the handwriting of his Aunt Laura. In other words, so she was the one who acquired these things. His mother did the, the, the earliest work, the people contributing things by and by, but over time, Charles was the only one left standing. So if you read his you know, obituary here, 
uh, by the 1930s, he's, he's, he's the last one, and there is actually no credit shared between him and anybody else in his family at all, so that by the time this stuff ends up at the Peabody, um, after he dies, it's all about him. Um, and so when you look back at it, you know, there are traces of his mother in, in this stuff, um, but it would have been pretty much impossible for him to have done most of the things that, that um, are attributed to him. And then the question is, is that him doing that on purpose, or is that just the, the erosion of these connections over time? Nonetheless, it becomes well, this guy who gets the credit for doing early research in the, in the Mesa Verde area, and, uh, and not, not his mother. And I, this is also from that accession thing, and I, I, I appreciate this because I think that's probably Catherine Marsh Sumner over there on the, on the far left, um, Hoven Wheat, but uh, you know, she's even being erased by the photography here, right? Um, so, so maybe a visual metaphor for, for her. And, and in fact, you, can't, you couldn't find her name in this collection at all. All right, so let me wrap this up very quickly here. Um, there's obviously nuance, there's lots of layers to, to unpeel and unpack here, but uh, I'm inspired in part by, by one hand by this quote from a Denver newspaper in 1898, which basically identifies Catherine Marsh Sumner as, as the person who knows the most about this, the, particularly the woman who knows the most about this. Um, and one could go from here and wonder why it is that, that you know, that, that mm, her name doesn't show up very often, and that's, that's worth asking. Um, on the other side is one of those photographs from that Smithsonian box, and, um, and I think it's a sort of a, I take it for a kind of a double-edged metaphor here. On the one hand, it was taken at the beginning of their excursion, right? Our cheerful beginning, um, which, you know, leads them up to Mesa Verde. Um, but you notice that even though the, there are women and men in this image, you can't really see women because they're back in the shade and it's the women in the front. Um, and so maybe that's uh, maybe a little more pointed aspect of the metaphor that we could pursue and it needs to be addressed through our, our research on the history of women in American archaeology. Thanks very much. Next presenter is going to be Brian Kenny talking to us about George McDuncan. George McDuncan. Um, should give these arrows. What's the point? The mouse. Would you be like the arrows there? Press down or press. Okay. okay. Thank you. Good morning. I uh, came over from Flagstaff yesterday and enjoyed going to the conference talk last night about the town site of Blackdom. It was really great. I'm sure. Some of you were there. I see some faces that were familiar from last night. And if you missed it, uh, go look at that presentation if you get a chance. It's really, it was really wonderful. Um, before I start, I want to give a little context to you um, so that you can put my talk in perspective. There's some uh, publications in our journal articles and elsewhere that talk about some themes that are prominent in archaeology today. And I'm just going to mention these real quick because Later on, you can go back and read these articles and then plug my work into that and see where we're going as a comparative sort of uh, uh, exercise. So uh, I just was looking through the journals that we published. American Antiquity, recent article uh, by uh, Lalek et al. Archaeology and Social Justice in Native America. Um, an article by... Uh, Flewellen and et al. It's the future of archaeology is anti-racist. Archaeology in the time of Black Lives Matter. And then um, a recent article in American Antiquity by Bonnie Piblado, Piblado on rehumanizing re Pleistocene people in the Western Hemisphere. And in this article, she talks about George McJunkin for a few sentences. So there's a there's a thing going on in American archaeology about um, social justice and about um, anti-racism and about anti-colonialism. And then there's another theme that's going on that's important to archaeologists, 
Uh, there's a recent article by Jeff Altschul and others that um, uh, forecasts for the U.S. CRM industry and job market, and it mentions that um, there's about $1.85 billion of work to do in the next 10 years, and we don't have enough uh, people to do the work because we don't have, one of the problems is we don't have field schools, or we should have more field schools. So with that in mind, um, I want to start my talk. I have 20 individuals who have helped me in the past 18 months um, that I call, these individuals, I group them as Team McJunkin. So they're not mentioned in these slides, but there are 20 people who have helped me directly get some work done, and I, I want you to know that this is not my work, but a team effort. You get a little irritated reading some books like Black Cowboy by Franklin Folsom, um, because it's a wonderful book, and it uh, is novelistic in a sense. It takes you through a story. But if you're an archaeologist, you throw the book down, and that's how I got started in this Project 18 20 months ago, reading some of this literature like this and stuff in, in the old archives, where, where the writer says, George had a cabin and he put all the stuff in it and the cabin burnt down and everything was destroyed, period. Of course, you know, the archaeologists think immediately, well, where's the stuff? It's in the ground. Where's the next sentence? Where's the next paragraph? Talking about the materials that were left behind. Well, this book is historical and not archaeological, so it leaves a big question mark. Where's all the stuff? So that's how I sort of got involved. I've been reading about George for years, and I decided I wanted to do something. So what I did was a little thought experiment. Um, we've been collaborating for the past 18 months, and we're talking about George McJunkin, who was a black cowboy and a ranch foreman who died approximately 100 years ago, and a little over 100 years ago, in January 1922. And this presentation today is our third presentation we gave two at the Pecos conference this summer. And we're currently discussing um, how to write a themed volume for a leading journal. And um, we're also talking about, as a team, uh, the idea of some sort of scholarly earth sciences and archaeological field school for black indigenous students and people of color who might want to participate, get their hands dirty, catch the bug, and decide to join the profession. So like this morning, there was a land acknowledgement um, mentioned this morning. We gave one at the Pecos conference, and I put it on here so that it's captured so that you can see it and use it in the future if, if need be. We acknowledged um, Native Americans in a long history that goes back 10 or 25,000 years. We acknowledged, um, since we're talking about a, 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 a black man working in a, in a rural northeastern New Mexico community, we acknowledged uh, uh, slavery in America, and he had been a slave and become a free man, very young in his life, and then moved to New Mexico. And we recognized that um, people achieved despite the burdens that had been placed upon them, and they give us some inspiration for how we can keep and win our own freedom from repression. Uh, we also acknowledged the ranching families that are out there. They came, survived harsh realities, and thrived in many different ways, and they helped us do this work in the field, um, in the few instances that we were able to get to Falls of New Mexico over the last 18 months. Um, so the last bullet point is probably the most important. It says that we acknowledge that people can come together to solve problems just as easily as they can fall apart, and working together clearly serves the better method. Well, this project is about working together. We've done a lot of working together, and I'm very appreciative. Um, I also have a general disclaimer that I just have to mention quickly. Um, we're still early in the research game. Uh, we're still engaged in that stuff that's called forming, storming, narrowing, the normal processes. I think we're sort of in the storming stage, trying to figure out what to do with the materials that we've been looking at. So I can use great ideas from all of you if you, if you uh, have read extensively or if you're going to read extensively or if you have thoughts that immediately pop in your mind from this presentation. 
you can certainly help educate me and uh, get me on the track for the things that I need to be looking at. I did a little experiment. I mentioned the desire uh, to start the project in 2021, and then there were a number of people who joined me, volunteered to join me, and uh, several of them went to Folsom, New Mexico to conduct different tasks. But while I was in Folsom, I asked the residents of the area um, about historical sites that were associated with George McJunkin on the private property. So private property was important because I didn't want to be on state land or federal land of any sort and have to deal with permits. I wanted to do rapid ethnography, talk with people, find out what was there, and be able to start documenting it so we could use it. Um, so each time I had a conversation, I'd say, show me, you know, we'd look at a map on a phone, on a piece of paper, some sort of format, we'd say, show me where the sites are. We'd, we'd mark them out. And then we came up with about a dozen, maybe 20, historical sites that were related to McJunkin or to other important activities in the area. For example, there's McJunkin sites there, but there's also cemeteries. There's also an Irish railroad camp, um, the town dump site, things like that, where you can find archaeological materials. Um, so these sketch maps um, that got plotted out on digital maps identified some different variations in site knowledge or local common site names and precise locations. And uh, what I discovered was there's sort of a folk uh, system that describes these sites. They use it among themselves to describe the site. They might call the sites by different names or, or have different ideas about the sites, but it's sort of a, a, a folk classification system among the local uh, inhabitants of the area. And when new people move to the community and live there for a long period of time, they get involved in it and they add to it and, and change it. So I've seen some individuals who told me, oh, I've lived here for 20 years, and they say, oh, well, old so-and-so used to call it this, but I call this site something else. And they have their own name for it when they take people out to show them. So it's an evolving pattern that we see going on. If you do a little bit of rapid ethnography, uh, you can build maps like this in any area, I, I, I suspect. Um, the next thing I did is I asked permission to visit the sites, and I conducted a windshield survey, probably visiting 12 sites to see that they were real, and that there was something on the ground, uh, looking at it like an archaeologist would to see if there's context and depth and um, disturbance and all the things that tell me whether the site has some value or not. So we stayed off the federal and state lands, um, and we were able to conclude that George McJunkin built and occupied and used and abandoned a variety of sites, and they're still there. And there are things like um, a place where he cooked biscuits, his uh, homes in the town of Folsom, uh, his homestead up in the hills away from town, nearly eight miles away from town, and a bunch of places where he worked on different ranches. And when we went out to look at these sites, we saw a lot of changes um, on the landscape that um, archaeologists would attribute to site formation processes. Uh, in other words, you know, you have a site, it falls apart, the artifacts are scattered on the ground, things happen to the site as time goes on. We could actually see those and identify them in several different ways. Uh, we went and looked at archival information, and uh, some of the team members looked at some of the early maps of the type that George McJunkin might have looked at, and then we looked at more recent stuff like the uh, state land, a uh, website that shows the township range sections and ownership. We compared early maps with later maps, and it was really quite an exercise because you take a parcel or an area and you look at as many maps as you can, go back as far as you can, you see changes. Some of the maps have features on them that others don't, and you wonder, well, why did that feature disappear? An early map shows a spring, a later map doesn't show the spring. And it's very important when you're trying to identify sites or where they might be located. So we looked at a bunch of maps, and uh, it was clear to us that George was operating in the Cartesian spaces to find 
with the township range section controls that had been identified, labeled, and established for homesteads and ranches in the area starting in the 1870s. So he wasn't out in the wilderness. There was a grid system out there, and he was working with ranchers to make sure that their fences were on the section lines and quarter section lines. And when he applied for his own homestead, he was going through a system that had been established some years before him. So the, the survey work occurred up in northeastern New Mexico in the 1870s, and he started applying for a homestead about 1894. So we also looked at the GLO records and his uh, application and his case file documents, and they provided additional data about how the land was acquired, by whom, for how long, and what changes or improvements were made on the property. And we could actually find the improvements on the property. Um, that was a really important thing because uh, several of the people who I've worked with told me that uh, there was a little bit of, you know, hanky-panky or fraud or I don't know what word you want to use uh, in applying for and owning homesteads and trading them. There, you know, if there's a system set up and somebody can sort of uh, work around the edges to get a piece of property and not do all the work, sometimes that occurred. And so there was this question about whether um, we'd see any of this in George's records. So we discovered that George McJunkin was probably a really straight arrow uh, when it came to proving up his homestead and acquiring his properties and um, establishing land ownership. His official records um, were completed in good order. There was no fraud evident in any of his claims paperwork. He made the improvements that he said he made, and you can still see these features on the landscape. Uh, the records really seem to corroborate that he fully engaged in the homestead rules and was a true believer in making his claims and building his fences tight. Um, so it led, led me at least to wonder how George Mark Junkin had developed such a strong sense of land ownership and private property. And uh, the records seem to demonstrate that, but where that came from, I'm not really sure. I think it's the local environment. Everybody had to have a parcel and be able to define it, and he was part of that system. Um, <clears throat> the, the U.S. Census records, a different set of records, also show George living on his homestead, and he was enumerated there in 1900 and 1910, indicating that his interests were long-term. Remember, he had filed in 1894. So he was there as late as 1910, and um, that's in keeping with him wanting to stay in the area and earn a living by working at the different ranches. Uh, we also examined historical aerial photographs where they were available of the local community to see what kind of changes uh, might be affecting archaeological sites. So one of the funniest things we found was we found an aerial photo of his burial location. Uh, we've, we've been to the cemetery and we know where he was buried, but we saw an aerial photo of it. And in the early days, that cemetery had an entrance on the east end. You see the photo up, up here. The, the cemetery had an entrance on the east end, and then later on, the entrance was moved to the northwest end. And that was probably because a road was ab abandoned and a new road was built. And you can see that on the aerial photographs. So what it means is George was buried, when he was originally buried in 1922, he was buried at the back of the cemetery, away from everyone else. Now, why he was buried at the back of the cemetery, away from everybody else, I don't have a clue. It might have simply been that it was the cheapest plot available. Or who picked it, we don't know. But you go to Folsom today and you go to the cemetery, you walk through the gate. He's now the first person that you see when you walk through the gate. And it's simply because the gate's been changed because the roadways have been changed. So we see those sorts of formation processes, and they can, they can fool you. What do they mean? We don't really know. I think George was a scientist, an architect, and an engineer. We, all, we always describe him as a black cowboy and a ranch foreman. But 
I think he's really a scientist, an architect, and an engineer. I include a uh, I include this because um, we're looking at a lot of his vernacular architecture and some of the formal stuff that he built on the ranches in the area, including houses, work sheds, fences, corrals, ditches, spring boxes, and waterworks. And these things still function today. Many of them are still in place. What surprised me most during my windshield survey and site visitation was that there were bricks all over the place. So he was not just using stone cobbles to build cabins, but he was also using formal building materials. And it surprised me because you find bricks in unusual places. So for an archeologist, you might look and see bricks and say, oh, this is gonna distinguish something, let's say like from a habitation or a house versus like a work room or a shed or an outbuilding. But we found out that it's mixed up. Sometimes you get bricks in places that you didn't expect. And there's a picture of a cabin up at the top in the center that's a stone cabin with a wooden roof and it has a steel fireplace and a steel stove in it at one end. When you get to the site and you look around on the ground outside, there's broken brick laying around. You go, oh, that's odd. And then you go inside and you, this picture here in the bottom, you look up into the ceiling and there's bricks up in the crawl space between the ceiling and the roof and it's a fire protection device. You know, the chimney, the, the pipe goes up to the roof, but that brick up in, up in the attic, is, it's just a little segment of brick. It's a thing that protects the house from burning down. So you find bricks in all sorts of unusual places, and I keyed in on the bricks very early, and um, there's something that going, they're going to be really cool uh, uh, research tasks that students can do if there's ever a field school there because there's all sorts of oddities like that that will jump out and inform you about how the sites were built, used, maintained, and discarded. Um, the well-known fire, fireplace picture here uh, shows a fireplace made of bricks. This was George's living room at the XYZ Ranch. But what happens is when you talk to the locals, they show you this photo and they say, oh yeah, his house burned down. I go to the site that they take me to that says, this is where the cabin was that burned down, and there, there are no bricks there. There's bricks in this photo, but not bricks at the site where they said it actually burned down. So instead, they've taken and conflated the photos and the stories into sort of a generic site. What you have is really two different sites. You have a site at the XYZ Ranch, and you have a cabin, um, up in the hills where all this stuff was burned down. So when you're talking about George and his life in this book and talking with the um, local residents, you get the story sort of blended together and you have to pull them apart. It's not clear what you're talking about at the beginning. And sometimes you take dead ends trying to chase down a lead to find out that it's really two different sites or two different time periods or two different events that have been blended into one. So the sites move around a bit, and uh, future archaeological work can probably straighten out some of the details to improve the story, including a timeline uh, and the nature events surrounding George's life. That picture on the right um, is George's house in Folsom. It's still standing. What's interesting about this house, it has some brick in it. You can see the fireplace, but there's brick on the ground. So something has come down and is buried in the ground. There's also a, a one or two course high stone wall around the outside of the house in certain portions. It looks identical to a stone wall built at another site that George was involved with. So he used native materials as well uh, to do construction or landscaping outside his property that this house is still standing. There's all sorts of out features around it that have never been excavated that probably would reveal a wealth of information. And the picture at the far left corner, you can see a house in the background. 
which is a later kit house, like a Sears house that was built in the 1920s, that's now abandoned. But down in the foreground of the photo there, you see a square outline. It was probably George's uh, shop where he did his farrier work and, and his, his metal work. There's a lot of scattered stuff on the ground there. So the, here's a standing house and then an archaeological site in outline, and who knows what's around it. So I'd like to tell you that in pondering what I looked at out there, that I think the artifacts and the sites have multiple meanings. Um, the metal artifacts that you see up there on the far left um, include items like buckles, straight edge shaving razors, and they're really cool little metal historic artifacts that you could take to a museum and people could handle them. And I'm inspired to wonder if uh, controlled excavations might produce additional personal hygiene items and whether from those DNA could ever be found and extracted. I don't know if it's possible, but the first thought I had was if there's personal items in the site, uh, there might be ways to get a DNA. And you could do things with DNA that uh, we, we know nothing about with regard to George at this point in time. There's an 1870s glass bottle base from the Mississippi Glass Company was found at one particular site that, at the cabin that burned down. So the glass company existed from 1870 to 1880. We're talking about a 1915 uh, era site, maybe 1918 era site. And you have to think to yourself, you know, why is there a... Why? Why is there a, a bottle that's been curated for that length of time? Must have been a really fabulous bottle. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of them up there, and a lot of other types of bottles on that site. And then at this site, at uh, um, Stuyvesant Springs, there's lots of buried features and ample surface trash. You can see in the far right, we have uh, a wall in the back and the, there's a little depression there and some sort of buried feature it might be um, something like a larder or some sort of underground storage room um, never been excavated seems to be intact in situ uh, once we dig into it we don't know what will be there but um, this site is full of archaeological material and then we go to another site like George's homestead. We can see his fences and his water features, and we can see the area where, where we think his cabin was. It's dense vegetation, so we need some more survey work. But there's very little trash around it. So you say, why does one site have so much and another habitation site has so little? And one of the locals said to me that, well, when you're out on the ranches and you've got a little cabin, you've got to take the trash away from the site and dump it in the arroyos because of the bears. So the discard behavior close to town is one thing, and the discard behavior out in the hills is something else, maybe. And you wonder, well, uh, is there no trash on this site because of garbage bears? Or is it something else or a combination of factors? So these are things that students could explore and archaeologists could explore to figure out what these patterns mean. Um, the picture on the lower right of the slide uh, depicts the layout of the ranch house at the XYZ. That's the one with the fireplace that you just saw. And there's a lot of literature here and elsewhere that George spent a lot of time with the rancher's kids trading horse lessons for reading and writing lessons so he could become a literate man. And the comment was made in several different ranches that he lived with the families and he was part of the family. So I don't know what that means, but when you look at this uh, drawing here, here's the household at the XYZ, but the slide shows the man's room is abutted to the house and it only has an exterior entry door. So all the other rooms in the house, inside the house, can be accessed from inside the house but his room is outside 
the main building, and he can only access it from an outside door. So there's something there about status or family um, family connections that, that needs to be explored, but we, we don't know what it means yet. He probably was with the family and part of the family, but the way we would define it today might be different the way archaeologists would identify space. So these sites and contexts and artifacts have multiple opportunities for understanding the past at different levels and scales of depositional um, activity and different scales of mid-range cultural theory. We don't know what it means at this point in time. Now, the thing that I'm thinking about by looking at the sites that George was a really straight arrow when it came to documenting uh, government documents that he had to produce and providing community service and conducting construction in the community. And he was a craftsman in many other ways, too. His personal and community artifacts lead me to wonder how he came by such great personal agency. That would be a research theme that we could look at is, here's a cowboy who comes to Folsom and he has great agency. So he demonstrates his skills. He actively sought opportunities to make money, to build his reputation and status in the community. And all these things probably helped him earn a living and, and thrive. He has a spring box at George Spring up at his homestead and it still functions today after a hundred years, as do some of his fences, corrals, and irrigation ditches that, that still run and produce water from the hillsides and the springs down to remote fields that grow hay and alfalfa, mostly hay. Um, the photo up in the upper left shows George on horseback on the far right side there. You see a little arrow pointing at him. He's wearing a white shirt and he's playing polo at a community event. Now, nowhere in the literature does it say anything about George playing polo, but he was a, he was a man of his times and that was a sport among horsemen and he was part of it. He demonstrated his skills and he built his status and his reputation in many different ways. He always wore a white shirt or mostly always wore a white shirt even when he was cowboying or working as a ranch foreman and he kept it clean because he wanted to demonstrate that he could work physically and still properly maintain his attire. His saddle above jumped out at me. This saddle is at the museum in Portales. And um, I looked at it and said, my gosh, on the, on the seat of the saddle up towards the horn, there's a maker's mark. And so I started researching the maker's mark and had some of my team members working on the saddle as well. The saddle and its maker's marks reveal an expensive piece of equipment that was built in Cheyenne, Wyoming by a well-respected saddle maker. We checked several museums in the region around Folsom and all the saddles are local. Now, you know that museums collect things for different reasons and so it's not a perfect sample. So I don't know um, how the museums collected those artifacts, but when you just compare it at the gross level, all of the saddles in all of the museums surrounding Folsom are all local saddles, all made by local craftsmen. George's saddle is the only one that is exotic, that comes from quite a distance, very well made, much more expensive, and higher quality. Um, does this mean that George McJunkin was actively building his reputation among his fellow cowboys and townsfolk while he was the foreman or the chief cowboy of the uh, cowboys out on the, out on the trail? It makes you wonder when you look at the artifact, if you came to town and saw that saddle on a well-trained horse standing somewhere tethered to the pole, you'd probably think that the owner was a man of means of, and of skill and high reputation. So George was really active in selecting his clothing, his gear, his outfit to make sure that he let people know that he was somebody that 
was reliable, trustworthy, understood culture, understood style, and, and could get the job done in a, in a very um, fluid and um, ex excellent way. So we're not really sure about any of this, but just looking at the artifacts in the museums and looking at the sites, we're inspired to think that good archaeological and archival work could be combined to convert and strengthen some of the McJunkin story and tell the story in a different way than we understand it now. Um, I think the material culture is the stuff that provides incontrovertible facts to our understanding, um, and we haven't done enough of that with George. Um, the artifacts, now here's the odd thing, the artifacts and historical records all suggest that George was on the side of the colonist and the capitalist system. He participated in it fully. He owned private property. He had a, st a strong sense of property ownership. He demonstrated agency among his fellow cowboys, among the ranch owners. And he built, he actively built his reputation status with all of those tools and, and items he was building on the landscape. Uh, this leads us to wonder if we can talk about George in different ways. Perhaps we should start talking about George uh, committed to acts of deep play, the way that Clifford Geertz described deep play in his famous essay about the Balinese cockfight. Nobody's ever made that connection, but if we took that as a premise and started looking at George's artifacts, we'd see a whole different story than what we know today. I would tell field school students that George McJunkin is probably famous for all the wrong reasons. He's famous because he found the Folsom site, but he discovered those bones and they led to an important archaeological discovery, but George becomes more real and less tangential to our discipline, as some people call him today, um, by, by looking at those sites. If you ask an archaeologist if George knew what he had at the Folsom site, there's a lot of discussion about it, and mostly it comes down to saying he really didn't know what was going on there. Um, but, um, so he's discounted that he's only a peripheral story to the archaeological community. Oh, he found the site that's great, but then somebody else went on to do the work and, and, and make, the, make the claim. But if we look at George um, and his site, his own personal historical sites, um, and we look at his agency, and we look at his deep play, we begin to understand a very different story about George. So what about George McJunkin? I think he's famous for the wrong reasons. So nobody said that before, so that's what I'm saying. Um, the Folsom site's a great part of our history, and George McJunkin's recognized. It's disputed that he knew anything. Um, I've had conversations in the last couple weeks about that very subject with colleagues. Um, so the story, I think, about George and Folsom has turned a bit static. It's not really growing and changing in the archaeological profession. So I have a feeling that the site is not where George McJunkin is going to make any additional mark in the future. However, because of those changes afoot in archaeology that I mentioned at the beginning of my talk about the future of archaeology being anti-racist, etc. Um, I think that we can turn our attention to issues like decolonizing the archaeological profession by looking at sites like those built by or, or abandoned by George McJunkin. I'm wondering if George's uh, historical sites and artifacts can help in this way, and I think that they might. The historical sites we visited are likely to reveal new information about a multiple multi-dimensional person, the black cowboy who was well-practiced in the arts, skilled at making a living and doing so on his own terms, despite facing a lot of adversity. Since archaeologists classically investigate the causes of inequality and injustice and do it contextually, these sites represent that something more, that context that we might be looking for. We can also investigate and compare George's historical sites with other sites in the area, both in town and out on the ranches. We might learn a good deal about inequality and equality and the leveling of personhood by such comparative 
and contrast of field efforts. These sites do provide a place and a context and theme to introduce black, indigenous, and people of color into the scholarly work of prehistory and history of the Southwest for a season or two or maybe five. So I'm beginning to think that I need to promote the idea that we have a field school or somebody have a field school that can grant credits to students so, so the university would need to be involved and uh, they go out and work on these issues that I'm talking about at these types of sites and they catch that bug of antiquity and science and they join our profession and thus we increase both diversity and the diversi diversification of interpretation in New Mexico. Here we are. I put the slide up here because you'll be able to catch it later and read it. People are talking about equality and leveling and this is the guy who's going to help us understand that more in New Mexico if we can only look at his sites. So finally, I'm really inspired to wonder about such opportunities. Um, there are several types of works that can be done in the future and there's only a little bit that's been done so far. We basically have a windshield survey. We're talking about writing a couple journal articles to describe this so everybody can see it. So that's the next step and then we've got to figure out if we can go beyond there. We need the goodwill and participation to advance the idea of having a black, indigenous, people of color archaeological field school and uh, we need cooperation to make sure other methods are employed to strengthen and diversify our profession. Thank you. Any questions? You can talk. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, think, I think the company in Cheyenne, Wyoming, who made the saddles, made a number of those. So there might have been a number of cowboys who had saddles like that, but there were none in the Folsom area. So George stood out. But it is a, it is a type of saddle with a high horn on it, and I think the Spanish cowboys, the Mexican cowboys, preferred some of those saddles to some of the Western saddles that you see today. When George was a young man before he came to Folsom and, and, and passed away there after years of work, he had been trained by Mexican cowboys uh, in Texas and he had done some of these long drives that came up through New Mexico up to Colorado. So um, he, his tradition was Mexican uh, vaquero uh, cowboy work and the saddle sort of reflects that a little bit also. Um, um, I, any Masonic symbols? Any Masonic symbols? Um, you're talking about the place that you usually when you find that in the Masonic Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I, I did, that didn't come to uh, uh, the forefront in any of my current work. It could be there, but I'm not sure. When you go to the town of Folsom, uh, there were some early uh, Spanish settlers and sheep ranchers and then uh, a lot of the ranchers who moved in uh, came in from places like Kansas and Missouri and they were immigrants also. The Doherty family is a, one of the families. So you have a split in the town and you can see it in the, in the physical construction of the town after the flood. There's a Protestant church on one side of town and a Catholic church on the other side of town. And there's a Catholic cemetery and a city cemetery, that's the Protestant cemetery. And then for all of those strangers who show up, who die in the local vicinity and they're unknown, they get buried at a third cemetery called Boot Hill. And um, if they're violent men or children who have not been baptized, etc., they go up on Boot Hill. And I haven't seen any Masonic symbols anywhere, but I went around and took photos of all of the headstones. 
And if I go back and look, it's probably there. I just didn't notice it. So it's probably there, I just don't know right now. Can we hold questions until after the next talk and then we'll do those? I'll, right I'll stop We're and a little bit behind now. I'll, I'll be around so that we can talk some more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presentation is going to be by Carl Lumbo. Use the arrow keys right. here, or if you want the mouse, it uh, should, no, no, it should just work on the right hand side. Just click forward here. Uh, let's see. Here. Nope. You might just need to hit the arrows if that's okay. Okay. Oh, wait, hold on. The mouse did something. Because the mouse is on the computer. Uh oh. So I mean, if you want to use the mouse, it has to be on that arrow. Okay. Otherwise, you just oh, arrow okay. On the keyboard. I'll, I'll just try this. I'll do. I'll do the keyboard. Okay. All righty, just a note on those saddles. Uh, cowboys all over the West used those high cantle saddles in that era. The low cantle saddles came along later in time. Uh, and I regret deeply that I don't have my grandfathers who actually worked with George McJunkin a little bit uh, in that area. But uh, that went the way of all things. Today I'm uh, talking about an episode of the 9th Cavalry, the uh, Buffalo Soldiers in the San Andres Mountains. Just a little background on the uh, Buffalo Soldiers. Uh, after the Civil War in 1866, they off two regiments of black cavalry were authorized, the 9th and the 10th. Uh, one was commanded by Hatch, Colonel Hatch, and the other one was Colonel Grierson. If you've seen uh, John Wayne's uh, movie about a uh, raid into the uh, south during the Civil War. I'm trying to remember the name of it right now. Though that was Grierson's raid uh, that was planned by Hatch. They were both generals in the Civil War. There were a lot of generals were officers out of the Civil War that were offered a command of the 9th and 10th. Uh, two that are distinguished in refusing to command black officers was General Armstrong, George Armstrong Custer and a fellow who will fe be featured in his report in this uh, presentation named Asa Carr, who ended up being in command of the 6th Cavalry in Arizona. Uh, there's lots of stories about how they weren't respected. Two stories that you never hear is one, how they saved the 7th Cavalry at the battle of, after the Battle of Wounded Knee uh, in a snowstorm. They marched all night and rescued them. Another one, God forbid we tell this story, is they rescued the Texas Rangers who were, who were protecting some entrepreneurs down in the El Paso in the Salt Wars. And the hatch brought the soldiers there, they lined up in formation, and everybody decided to stop fighting. I also want to say that the work at Embryo, uh, the main battlefield, which this will include, and the Embryo skirmish, which this focuses on, was funded by the White Sands Missile Range Environmental Division. And uh, they've been very supportive. And both of these sites are now a field drive uh, for officers, uh, cadets, uh, who come to White Sands to study the techniques of guerrilla warfare, of which Victorio was the primary professor in the 1880s. So, having said all that, oh, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> okay. Nope. How do I get rid of it? It's gone. Is it gone? Oh, good. Okay. On April 5th, 1880, a veteran lieutenant, no, nope. well, I won't be able to keep it right there, so, there we go. Yeah. just this one? Yep. All right. In 1880, April 5th, 1880, a veteran lieutenant led an undersized company of 9th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers into the San Andreas Mountains in search of Victoria's Apache. <laughs> 
The San Andres Mountains are located next to the White Sands in southern New Mexico. The Victoria War was the end of a 10-year struggle by the Warm Springs Apache to maintain a reservation at Ojo Caliente located in southwestern New Mexico. Victoria's band totaled approximately 60 warriors and 100 women and children. Nane was one of his trusted lieutenants. Both Victoria and Nane were over 60 years of age. Colonel Edward Hatch commanded the 9th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers and the 15th Infantry, which were white. In January 1880, Hatch made plans to end the several month old Victoria War. Unfortunately, there are few photographs of 9th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers in New Mexico. This image uh, is of Hatch's funeral escort in 1889 as his non-commissioned officers. Two of these men were at Embryo. Knowing that Apache scouts would be the only effective way to pursue Victorio, Hatch obtained three companies of scouts from Arizona. Accompanying the scouts was Company L, 6th Cavalry, led by Captain Kerwin B. McClellan. In early 1880, Victorio brought his people to the Himbrio Basin in the San Andres Mountains. It was a safe place, a stronghold with permanent water. Hatch organized three battalions. One, commanded by Captain Henry Carroll, consisted of four companies of the 9th Cavalry at Fort Stanton. The other two battalions gathered at Palomas. In March, it became known that Victoria was in Embryo, where he had been joined by a number of Mescalero. Captain Carroll was ordered to the east side of the San Andres Mountains. Hatch would move from Palomas across the Jornada del Muerto to attack Victorio's camp. Historians have relied on six cavalry officers to interpret the Battle of Embryo. Primary are the memoirs of 2nd Lieutenant, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Thomas Cruz and Captain Kerwin McClellan's company return. In late March, Carroll left Fort Stanton. He overnighted on April 4th at Malpai Springs in the Tularosa Basin. According to Cruz, the troopers watered at Malpai Springs, unaware that it contained gypsum uh, in sufficient quantity to make man and beast ill. Partially incapacitated, Carroll pressed on to an unnamed spring, but the second spring was dry. Now remember, this is the 6th Cavalry account. Carroll arrived at Embryo by about 6 p.m. on April 6th. He had split his battalion, sending two companies to a sure water source at San Nicolas Springs. Carroll led two companies toward a spring in Embryo where they were attacked and surrounded by the Apache. From Aliman, in the middle of the Hornada, Hatch sent McClellan towards Himbrio on a night march with one company of 6th Cavalry and the Apache Scouts. McClellan reported, On the morning of the 7th, I reached the point designated and found that the Indians were there in force. Occasional shots were being fired, but it was some time before I could discover to whom this fire was directed. I at once proceeded to put my pack train and animals into a secure position and ordered the Indian scouts to the attack, and gallantly they went into action. In less than half an hour, we discovered Captain Carroll with his company in a helpless condition, he being wounded twice, and eight of his men also wounded. Through some misapprehension of orders given, he got into the pass one day too soon, and was, when discovered, completely at the mercy of the Indians. Colonel Eugene Carr, fellow I mentioned earlier that had refused the commission with the Black Cavalry, commander of the 6th Cavalry, had scathing remarks about the role of the 9th Cavalry at Embryo. It appears from this report that the only fights during the last campaign in New Mexico were principally carried on by Arizona troops, and the one on which Colonel Hatch reported that Victoria was so badly punished was commanded by Captain McClellan of my regiment who found Captain Carroll's company in a condition of helplessness. Thus, the 6th Cavalry took credit for rescuing the 9th. 
A volunteer who frequented the Hembrio Basin in the early 1950s led us to cartridges and breastworks in the basin. We metal detected a 900 acre area of reconnaissance, recovering over 1,100 artifacts. Artifacts were individually mapped and the data entered into a geographic information system. Here you see the distribution of artifacts. The artifacts included 45, 55, 50, 44, 44, 40, and 45 caliber cartridges, plus a lot of odd ones. Dr. Doug Scott forensic analysis compared the firing pin marks to determine which cartridges were fired from the same weapon. The model of the weapon was determined by the extractor marks. These data allow a specific weapon to be tracked across the battlefield. Here we see the distribution of 50 caliber cartridges fired from 1866 Springfields. Isolating the guns from the northeastern area, we see that guns 2, 3, and 16 were fired from that position. When we plot those particular guns across the battlefield, a pattern of movement can be tracked when considered with the historical accounts. <coughs> After serving in the Civil War, John Conlon obtained an appointment to West Point in 1863. Despite struggles with classes and depression, he graduated and was assigned to the 9th Cavalry, serving for 10 years in Texas and New Mexico. The 9th Cavalry officers wrote very little about the Battle of Embryo. Carroll, severely wounded, had written nothing at all. Until Conlon's account was discovered, no one really knew what had transpired. And here's to colleagues. Dr. Charles Kinner graciously, graciously provided me an account written for the Order of Palestine Bulletin, a Masonic Lodge, in 1903, which led to Conlon's muster roll account. The unusually long muster roll account was written three weeks after the action. Compare the length of Charles Taylor's account with that of Conlon's for the same time period. The man's my hero, he wrote about it. Here's his story. After overnighting on April 4th at Malpai Spring, Conlon writes, the next morning, April 5th, my Troop A, 9th Cavalry, was ordered in advance to ascertain the location of Victorio's band in the San Andreas Range and communicate with and assist Major Morrow's command, a part of the forest operating against Victorio from the west. I made a rapid march of about 37 miles nearly due south to Mimbrio Canyon. They called it Mimbrio, San Andreas Mountains. And at 4.20 p.m. I struck a fresh tri trail of about 50 horses and 10 or more head of cattle heading up the canyon a short distance from its mouth. I followed the trail about one and a half miles to a point where the canyon became much narrower or boxed up. Here the troop was halted and dismounted, and owing to the strong impression gained that the Indians were not far away, a small guard was placed over the horses in rear, and the company on foot was immediately formed in a concave line of battle in open order, with right and left flanks resting against the steep sides of the canyon and facing toward the head. I posted a vedette about 400 yards in front, and the men in line were posted behind rocks and small boulders. Vedette is a common term in the old army for sentries or guards. I also sent two citizen guides and four soldiers up the canyon to examine and report, and upon their return, no Indians were reported in sight. Conlon's description provided the location of the skirmish. This area was also metal detected using volunteers, including Mescalero Apache tribal members. In just a few weeks of field work, a few days of field work, the skirmish line and a number of Apache positions were located. Of the 172 artifacts recovered, 129 were cartridges. 
Most were from 4555 Springfield carbines, but Winchesters, Sharps, Henrys, and Colt cartridges were also recovered. Cartridges from 19 carbines associated with Conlon's skirmish line were recovered. As every fourth trooper held the horses, almost all troopers in the line are represented. The variety of cartridges recovered. Note the split 45-55 cartridge that was probably fired by an Apache in a 50 caliber rifle due to a lack of appropriate ammunition, splitting that cartridge. 21 to 25 Apaches are represented by either cartridges or muzzle-loading bullets and metal arrowheads. The two metal points had bent tips caused, caused by impact and the 50 caliber round ball had been chewed into shape. Conlon's 80 plus meter skirmish line was clearly defined. The horse herd location yielded fragments of tack and horseshoe nail. This is Conlon's Ridge looking up canyon. It's kind of a low little ridge. I wouldn't have want to been there. Conlon speaks. The Apaches always laugh when they hear this. I felt morally certain, however, that Indians were in the neighborhood. <laughs> After all preparations had been made for an attack and to prevent a surprise by the Indians, and according to my usual habit, I made a careful examination of the canyon in every direction. Through a powerful pair of field glasses, and a little before 5 p.m., I saw up the canyon first two Indians, and upon turning the glasses to the right, I discovered about 35 to 50 more Indians coming down the hillside into the canyon on the run. I informed the men in line of their approach, and at 5.30 p.m., the first shot was fired from our line. When the Indians advanced to within 250 yards, a heavy fire was opened, which caused them to halt and seek cover. Cartridges show that Conlon's vedettes were positioned by a boulder located 100 meters in front of the skirmish line. Cartridges from the same three carbines are found between the boulder and the skirmish line as the vedettes continued to fire during their retreat. The Apache offensive was slowed but not halted. Cartridges indicate that Apaches moved forward in a frontal attack. Uh, Conlon's muster roll states, the Indians made several attempts to turn my flank, but their effort, efforts in this direction were repelled. The flanking action came much closer to success than his report indicates. Cartridges provide moot testimony that at least two Apache fired at Conlon's position from the right rear. These cartridges combined with two metal arrow points suggest that the Apache attacked the right flank as others were engaged in the frontal assault. Cartridges indicate that several troopers created a second skirmish line between the arroyo and the horse herd. Metal arrowheads indicate the proximity of the Apache. Conlon writes, when the Indians were about 350 yards in front of me, Victorio was heard giving orders to Chevena, one of his sub-chiefs, then opposite our right, to turn our right flank. Conlon reports that Jose Carillo, and there's a story, a scout and an interpreter identified Victorio. Conlon continues, Victorio's Indians, having been defeated in their attempt to take us by surprise, rush our camp, stampede and capture our horses, retired up the canyon and built a large fire about 500 yards in front near the dry river bed at 7.30 p.m. The action lasted two hours and ended sometime before dark. There was no water where the engagement, engagement took place and I did not know of any except on the trail on which I came. I decided to rejoin the main body of the command, which was met on the road at 11 p.m. Conlon's troops disengaged and rejoined Carroll's 2nd Battalion on the Salt Trail. 
a long established road for wheeled vehicles leading to the Salt Lakes west of Malpai Spring. Carroll took aggressive action. Early the next morning on April 6th, the command marched to Sulphur Canyon, now known as San Jose, or now at that time it was San Jose Canyon. Two companies followed Carroll into the mountains, while two companies were sent south with the intent of ascending the mountain slopes. Carroll reconsidered that situation. He was going up this canyon and there might be more Apaches there than he could handle. And he very wisely sent couriers to go tell those other two companies to come in behind him. And uh, his account makes it clear that Carroll had thoughtfully arranged for his own rescue. That afternoon, Carroll approached Cambrio from the north. The Apache utilized the terrain as a V-shaped trap, allowing Carroll's troopers to ride deep into the trap before firing. First Lieutenant Martin Hughes, commander of Carroll's second company, states in his very short muster roll account, and he seems a little annoyed by it, on April 6, 1880, we were attacked. Carroll led his troops onto the nearest available ridge and arranged them in two defensive lines. The saving grace was that it was soon dark. Records from the National Naval Observatory revealed that the moon did not rise until 4.20 a.m. and then it was only a small sliver. By morning, the Apache were closing in, stampeding some of the horses during the night and forcing the troopers to use their pistols. One entire skirmish line, 22 pistols were out. Short distance. In extremis. Relief came in the morning, but in stark rebuttal of six cavalry accounts, it was Conlon and Cusack who arrived first, forcing the Apache retreat. Conlon reports, while the officers were consulting as to the best course to drive the Indians from positions covering the water, their deliberations were interrupted by two or three volleys fired into the group of officers by the Indian scouts of McClellan's command who mistook us for Victorio's band. <laughs> These volleys were fired from the crest of a high hill in rear of and commanding our position, and although about 150 or 200 shots were fired at 400 yards range into the four troops of the 2nd Battalion, no damage was done except the wounding of one mule in the knee, showing very poor shooting on the part of the friendly Indians. The combined forces arranged themselves facing Victorio Ridge, where Victorio had left a rear guard while sending his non-combatants out of Embryo. This was Conlon's view of Victorio Ridge. Thomas Cruz said of the ridge, he said, I know I didn't kill any Apaches because I didn't see any Apaches. All I saw was a long, low ridge from which came smoke and bullets. The Apache scout companies executed a flanking action while the troops advanced. Conlon states, soon after 9 a.m., Companies A and G, 9th Cavalry, Lieutenant Cusack commanding with part of the Indian scouts deploying as skirmishers, covering a front of about 700 yards, advanced and drove the Indians from the hill nearly east of the water and from which they opened fire on us in the morning. The Indians retreated in a southeasterly direction up the side of a high mountain. James Kawakla told Eve Ball, Apaches like to fight with a mountain at their backs. They can just move back, keep everybody below them. And that's what they did. Thus ended the Battle of Embryo. Unfortunately, for the legacy of the ninth, the six cavalry accounts made the history books. Researchers have consistently repeated Cruz's account of the bad water at Malpai Springs and all his troopers. Uh, Conlon's lengthy account never discusses sickness from bad water at Malpai Springs and all his troopers did after drinking it was ride 37 miles, have a two hour skirmish with the Apache, disengage and rejoin Carroll in the middle of the night get up the next morning, ride back to the mouth of Embryo, turn around and ride into the mountains until dark, 
camp, wake up the next morning, and at 7 a.m. participate in a frontal assault on Victoria Ridge. If the Buffalo soldiers were suffering from the water, there's no telling what they might have accomplished had the water been good. <laughs> Another significant factor comes from the letters of Second Lieutenant Walter Finley, who was a good boy, he was just out of West Point, he wrote his mother and his mother saved all the letters. The reason I was not in the last fight was that I had been appointed assistant quartermaster for the battalion and had to stay with the train. I had two wagons loaded with water barrels and I camped out on the plain three miles from the mountain in which the fight took place. So Carol was bringing his water with him. He knew there was a problem with water. Carol had the advantage of established roads. A military road from Tularosa to Fort Craig led to Mount By Springs and then the Salt Trail led south. Knowing that water was scarce, he brought it with him. Uh, Conlon, having been engaged with the Apache, uh, Carroll was aware of the Apache location and minimized his own risk by arranging for those reinforcements. So, here's to Lieutenant John Conlon. His account, combined with forensic archaeology, provides a revisionist history of the Battle of Embryo and gives the 9th Cavalry Buffalo Soldiers their due. Thank you. All right, uh, we've got a lunch break until 1 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have the um, New Mac board meeting here in this space just for the next few minutes before we take a lunch break. Anyone's welcome to stay and attend that if you'd like to. Um, is, is Mr. Stewart still in? We have yeah, one right. question. Right here. Oh, we have one question from the, the chat. Yes, in the room. Um, let's hope they can hear me answer from here. So, uh, is there any evidence that the, pers the female personal secretaries, personal assistants, lab assistants, and et cetera, the better known male anthropologists were actually involved in interpreting anthropological data, even if they are not formally acknowledged in any publications? So, I would say that's a big question beyond my specific expertise. Um, it took me this particular period of time that division of labor was not completely as established. Um, I would expect, and it would be, the answer would be yes, read my expectation, but, uh, but we'd be getting beyond what I particularly address here. Okay.